Beyond the Ring, a podcast that covers all things in the stock show industry from the informative to the insane, starring Ryan Rash. I am just letting you all know now, it is not a Barbie world for everyone. The end. And Dale Hummel. We cannot always build the future for our youth, but we can build our youth for the future. Now on with the show. Welcome to Beyond the Ring. This is Dale Hummel, along with co-star Ryan Rash. Hello, hello, hello. Tell me about the current events for the week, Ryan. Well, see, like people don't realize that we actually record this normally on a Sunday or a Monday and it doesn't drop till Friday. So that's why, like, when the whole Jason Aldean nonsense of it all, that hadn't happened when we recorded last week. So all you people that, like, message me saying, why didn't you talk about it? I'm talking about it now. Okay. <laughs> Have at it. You and I might agree on this. Maybe. Okay. So here's my thing. Personally, I am not like a music person in general. Like I am the person that drives in the car hours and never turns the radio on. But isn't, isn't that a, isn't that a gay trait to be a music person? Again, I'm the worst gay person in the history of the world. We all know this, but so anyway, I'm sure his music is fine. I have listened to this song. I have listened to the lyrics. I am not personally offended by any of it. Okay, you better not be. You should be very in, proud. In terms of his lyrics, I am not personally offended by any of it. I think there's a lot of truth in those lyrics, all these things. And first of all, it, we still have freedom of speech in this country, so he should be able to sing whatever the hell he wants to sing. Now, The only thing that I am going to say about all of this, and I do not think it should have been pulled. I do not think they are all just look every, and and this goes both ways. The right's looking for cancel the left and left's trying to cancel the right, all things. But the only thing that I will say is first off, Jason Aldean did not pick the location or the green screen that they used of the courthouse in question in this video. The courthouse in question was the, there was the lynching there, and then there was a race riot 20 years later. This was like in 1920s, 1940s, all this stuff. It is a very controversial place. Yes, it has been used in lots of other TV, movies, videos, all this other stuff. But those TV, movies, and videos were not talking about riots and Black Lives Matter and all this other stuff. I don't care. My thing is, is the production company, whoever chose that location, they should have been smart enough to chose a different one because they should have known that this was going to happen. But again, I I don't have any... It's crap that you even have to look that deep. It is. I'm just telling you my opinion on it. I think it is all stupid. I think it is fine. But I'm telling you, I do think if they did not want it taken off CMT and all this other stuff, the production company should have been a little smarter. That's all I have to say I, about it. I don't. I don't think they even brought the courthouse up when it, oh, when yes, it first they did. dropped. I thought it was. An no, that's what got it pulled. Well, no, that's yes, I, no, I no, I'm saying eventually, but they were against it, and then I don't know. A, some time went by, and then all of a sudden, somebody digs up. Song dropped in May, and then when finally they figured out how to get it pulled, and it was the courthouse, and that's why I'm saying. They had been trying to get it pulled since the song came out, and they couldn't until they figured out the courthouse thing. And that's why I'm just saying the production company should have been smarter. I don't think that's Jason Aldean's fault or anybody else's. I just think they should have been smarter. I, but it's I, worked out beautifully for him. It's the number one song. He's making more millions than ever. So good for you. I mean, that that song summarizes the crap that's going on. I I absolutely behind it 100% in terms of, it just it, it it wouldn't happen in a lot of places in the U.S. Wouldn't be allowed to happen. And thank God there's still some of those places left. I also like to say I don't think he's hot. But next, <laughs> God, okay. Russia is shutting down the Ukraine grain export avenues, trying to strangle Ukraine again. Not good. Putin thinks he's he's. Didn't back we cover this last that. week? I just want them to blow each other up and be done with it. Yeah, no, we covered we covered Ukraine. Not not that they're jumping back in on on trying to, to starve the the world. Uh the southern border. Your 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 governor. I'm very. We're getting proud of him. sued. Yes, over big orange buoys. Yes, they so very because, large. 
because our president of the United States has no control over the border, doesn't want there to be any control over the border, all this other stuff. Abbott took matter into his own hands and he put in this gigantic buoy system on the Red River at the border of Texas. And now the Department of Justice, Biden's Department of Justice, is suing us, suing the state of Texas. Even though they're trying to protect their sovereignty. Yes, exactly. And the, the, it, it, the, the thing is, like, less than two years ago, NATO said that the greatest crisis was the southern border of the United States. So, like, this, I This just, is NATO saying yes, that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> NATO. The world. Yeah, that, that takes quite a bit for NATO to come out on anything like that. And, yeah, so I, I, I get after it, big boy. That's all I got to tell you. I, I think we're, we're in such a mess that right now the disorganization, the chaos. So when we're, we're, we have people down there putting these out and someone else comes along from, say, the Border Patrol, you've got, you have the Border Patrol helping them across. You have the state police, the state National Guard, whoever it may be, putting these out. And then you have somebody that comes by and, and tries to tell them, hey, you can't do that. And it's just what, how do you know what you're supposed to follow? If you're one of those workers, dude, it's total chaos. I think those with the guns are going to win this battle. I mean, I'm, I, I, I have been saying for a number of years now that we just keep inching closer and closer to civil war, but it's, it's almost, it's almost like there is no longer a system where here's right and wrong. It's all being challenged and it's going to end up in, five appeals and eventually in the Supreme court a year later, it, it, it is, it is very saddening for me to, to even think that a governor would be putting their, their state in the position to be sued by the federal government because they're trying to shut down their own state border. Well, I'm proud of him. I mean, again, Abbott has been a very decent governor he, he or let me put it there. He was uh, a were, decent. Go- very no, hold on. He was a ago. decent governor until Rona. Then he absolutely sucked there for like the onset of Rona. And then he said, "Oh shit, I'm not going to get reelected, so I got to do something." And ever since that flip switched, he's been great. I mean, truly, like, but I, I don't. I, I can't believe that it took a you know pandemic to turn him into a smart governor. He wasn't bad before, then he was really terrible, and now he's a great one. So, I don't know. He's like at least bipolar. But anyway. so, what about what about your your number one candidate, Mr. Pence, not qualifying for the debate? I just think it, it's beautiful, wonderful. Did, did not get 40,000 no, independent. There's not 40,000 people in America that want to give him money, and I, I do not is blame money in on your on your and behalf. I don't blame anybody for that because I he is such a pussy. I, I hate I, that I, man. I, I, I did not, not like that man when he was governor of Indiana. I did not like him when he was vice president. I do not like him now. He made one anti gay comment. That's no, it. And it, it didn't even have anything to do with that. He has no backbone. He's a nice That's, guy, I think he understands policy. He's fine. He's, he's not nice going to be. Guy. He's that not going to be excuse elected. for everything. Anybody? Why did so and so get to judge that? Because he's a nice guy. Oh, good. Okay. Yay. Woo. No, he's not going to get elected. Anything. He's, he's not going to get elected. Anything. Dog catcher. Probably not. So, did you? Is is Trump going to show up for the first debate? I don't know. I hope he does. Um, I think he's going to. Hmm. I don't think he will. He hasn't said that. I'm just telling you. He has done just like he has done everything else since he came down that damn scare case in 2015. He sits there and says, maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Maybe He keeps people guessing. And I'm okay with that. I'm fine with that. I I don't know. I think he is doing, if he does not, I think he is doing himself a great disservice because all of the other candidates can't really, like, run over him with the bus over the president's department of justice trying to put him in jail. Now they can, if he's too smug to not go to the first debate. I just think that a lot of them are be afraid to it. If he's not there and I'm, I'm up there on stage as a potential or as a candidate, I would be afraid of offending his followers by beating up on him. Too oh, well, they are. But, uh, and again, Trump is very good at what he does. And so he should just go there and, you know, 
I mean, he's and he will do just like he did the last when he ran the first time. There was sixteen people. He was always nice to Ben Carson. Always good to him. He'll be that same way to Scott. I think he'll be fine to Nikki Haley and the rest of them. He will literally eviscerate them. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, that's what I do. And I mean, at the two the polls came out today. And again, in Iowa, which they all keep saying, DeSantis is like, we're gaining ground in Iowa. No, so you're not. It is 46 to 16. DeSant- Trump to DeSantis and then Scott's at 11 and then the, nobody cares. And then in South Carolina, which I know Nikki Haley's from there, but DeSantis is third. So Nikki is second? Yes, it is 48% Trump, 14% Nikki, 13% your boyfriend, Ron. So, he, he now, I, now I did I did hear some, and, and, I, and I could be wrong, in Trump's first debate that he went into, he was at a very low number. Oh, the very... The very first debate he ever did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now he was like fifth in. It wasn't, it wasn't very high. No, because he, I, I remember exactly because he would, Bush, because the way they stack the candidates on stage, whoever's in the lead is in the middle. And then they go, you know, left, right. And he was two from center. So he was fifth. Got it. But well, it'll be, it'll be then bad. he eviscerated everybody. And then like after that, by the time the next debate, he was first. But I think he should go, whether he would or not. I, I, and again, we're getting long, but I, I just, uh, this whole Hunter Biden, Joe, they've got more people and whistleblowers, and now the business partner is going to testify Monday. And Ryan, when, I, when do we, when do we finally have enough evidence? For, we, we've had enough for ye- years. Do, do oh, the simple think, math. And again, I think the thing the thing that people miss is yeah, like you want him to go to jail. No, okay? I I want more. Okay, you want more. This is all not so, Hunter. I no, want Joe in jail. <laughs> I know you could care less about Hunter. It is the court of public opinion that is what this is about. There's not going to be anything happen. Maybe there be charged. How can there not be with those kind of records, those kind of testimonies? Just do okay, let's, the let's, president. Let's strip. Yes. <laughs> strip everything. Strip everything away from all the evidence and everything, and let's just do the math. The 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 Biden family fortune. Where did it come from? Joe's been in in politics or under the government payroll since he's somewhere in his twenties. Do the math on what salary he made and and what you're going to spend just to live. It came from somewhere. And it, it and a lot of it came honestly. A lot of it was you can if you were Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden, they can pay, write you a check for five hundred thousand dollars to go speak at, you know, some law firm or whatever. All those other stuff. So some of it is legitimate. A lot of it is not. No, not much. No, and and, he, and Hillary not. both. And again, it's the same. Don't thing. don't get me started on Hillary. Do not. But the the whole thing is they are doing this so he cannot run. And what I do, what I want to know, and he's not going to run. You can get on CNN and MSNBC and all these other things, and every day it's a little more. Now we're a little more concerned about the age issue, and we're not we're not easing people's minds, and we're not being pro uh, progressive enough on his age issue, and he needs to handle that. And now we've got these things that you know, while even though it's not Hunter's been never been elected, it still is his son. And this what I mean, every day, even the libs in the mainstream media are just inching a little closer. And then there's going to be something that drops and they're going to be like, okay, done by whatever. Do you think but, anybody's given Joe heads up that this is happening? Cause he's not coherent enough to figure it out. No, I don't think so. Probably not. But I mean, if, if you, and I know you could not watch CNN or MSB and C you're, cause your head would, spin around and you would vomit pea soup like the exorcist or explode or something. But I'm just saying it, if you would have watched those things, they are, the tide is turning. And just like when judge Janine said, when the media turns against him, that is when you will know that he's not running and it's getting closer every single day. I just wish that it would get here so I could figure out who the hell we have to run against because I don't think they're going to let Kennedy do it. I don't. I do not. No, they 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 would rather. They, they, if and I'm, and I'm glad they're not. 
That's that's wonderful. I'm telling you, that is a very, very rational, very smart, very intelligent man with good policy. And I, I, I think I, I, I just. He, 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 I'm telling you that the far left just. I would not be upset if smart. he was our president at all. If if oh. if he follows through with what he says. I would not, if, but if we have to have it, ninety nine percent of politicians do not. But I, I, if I have no other choice, and it has to be a Democrat, fine. He's he's as moderate as they get. But, but I, they they will. I mean, and I do not wish this on him at all. Because again, I'm telling you, I have listened, I have paid attention, and I think he. The only reason he is running as a Democrat is because his it like his whole family has given literally blood for the Democratic Party. I am very afraid that he may be the next Kennedy to be assassinated because like dude is with it. He is sharp and he I, makes, I believe he so has much a better sense. chance if he would jump ship and run as an independent, which is too late. I assume to do it's, that. Yeah. I think that shit. I mean, yeah, I don't think so either. I don't, but the, well, the they're, whole, they're not, they're not going to get behind him. No, they they're not. And they, then your the, boyfriend when he was, out in California will be their, be their, their, their Golden boy. Well, I I think you're right. I think I think Gavin because Nancy. If you notice, Nancy had kind of fallen off the radar, like really, really fallen after she wasn't speaker. I mean, whatever. But she and this week she's been on every single thing, and she's like uh, talking about the the whistleblower things, and it was a clown show and all this stuff. She's just emerged out of nowhere, and I bet it's because they're polishing Gavin up. But I was waiting to see her on some of those stock programs for stock tips, things like that. Yes, I'm sure you Fox are. Business. Yes, I, I don't think she's ever been on Fox, and probably not going to be. She she has a better record than anybody out there. Uh, the best yes. traders there are. Yes, she should be in jail too, according to you. Which I'm not. I'm not. I'm with you on her. <laughs> okay, we better we better continue on. What about some BTR JLA news? BTR JLA news. Well. Let me find my standings that I pulled up. So today, this week, we would like to recognize the top 10 intermediate goat exhibitors in the nation as of right now. In first place, Travis Arney from Indiana. Second place, Piper Liska from Arizona. Third place, Addison Sharp from Utah. Fourth place, Piper Crooks from Indiana. Fifth place, Caitlin Baldwin from Oregon. Sixth place, Michael Roselle from Oregon. Seventh place, Ashley Poling of West Virginia. Eighth place, Caden. Oh, I'm going to mess up your last name, Cadence. Wiesmeyer from Nevada. Uh, ninth is Braylon Miller of Ohio. And tenth is Christian Stockberger of Indiana. So congratulations to all of those for being the top ten right now. And we that was have, the best you've ever done pronouncing names. That I don't know. Good. I'm telling you, poor cadence. I, I probably butchered that. But uh, I want to personally thank Creed Garriott of Creed Garriott Goat Fitting Clinics because he has stepped up and become the Region 4 Goat Species Sponsor. And so uh, if you are a Caprine enthusiast seeking to gain competitive edge, look no further than Creed Garriott Goat Fitting Clinics. Creed and his team provide a hands-on course that will teach you how to get your goat show ring ready. The step-by-step program targets all skill levels from novice to expert. When booking your spot at Creed Garrett Goat Fitting Clinic, you ensure one-on-one time with an industry-leading professional who can help you identify your strengths and weaknesses and give you the skills that you need to compete at a higher level. When you're ready to take the next step, you can reach out and book your spot with them directly to host a clinic at your favorite barn or fairgrounds. And the best way to do that is to find Creed Garrett Goat Fitting Clinics on Facebook, or you can email them at booking at goatfittingclinics.com. Thank you, Creed. We greatly appreciate your support. We love having new donors. And uh, speaking of donors, we're halfway through the year. And so I want to say that we need more regional sponsors if they want if all these regions want to have a full awards program, Region One again, we need we need two in Region One. Uh, we need a pig and a goat in Region One, 
In Region 2, we need goat. In Region 3, we need goat. What the hell is wrong with all you goat people, Dale? (laughs) Region 4, we need cattle. And Region 5, we need cattle and pig. So, if you're interested in becoming a Region Species Sponsor, again, please contact me. We will be more than happy to talk to you about it. And uh, again, you get lots of social media announcements. You get a podcast spot. So it's a really good deal and it helps very deserving kids. Excellent. And I, and I'm going to, I'm going to thank Creed Garrett as well. And in many, many years ago, Ryan, when we decided to buy a bunch of goats out of Texas, we actually brought Creed on as an employee and he, he, I'd locked him in the barn for about a year. He didn't hardly leave the barn. All he did was clip and fit goats and figure out. That's what's wrong with him. It is. So, so, I mean, he, he was instrumental in, in bringing goats into the real world and the, into no longer in the backseat and becoming trendy and, and looking the part. And all we did was try to clip them like cattle. And he, he has as much experience out there in this game as anybody in, in very, very talented young man. So thank you Creed for that. As I traveled to shows across the Midwest this past week, again, I've been approached by several individuals with show fresh H2O success stories. It's simple. Add show fresh H2O to your water. The show animal, it will neutralize the chlorine, allowing your show animal to consume more water. Show fresh H2O can be purchased at your local farm store, supply trailer, and online at swampfox.com. We appreciate your support of this podcast and allowing Clifton to get paid each and every week. Thank you, Show Fresh H two O. Ryan, it's time. One other BCRJLA thing. Sorry, yep. uh, I want to give a shout out to Jared Sliff. Uh, I don't know when if they're all out, but anyway, we last year to the national champion in the four different species, we purchased Jared Sliff trophies from him, and I know the I know the goat girl Reagan Rogers. She got hers, and it is beautiful. Thank you, Jared, for uh, doing that for us. We greatly appreciate it, and I can't wait to see the other ones. But those are very, very cool, and again, very special award that we gave out last year. It is, and I think it's incredible. And, and speaking of, of talented and very artistic, and I've, I've known Jared for a very long time, but some of those carvings he's creating are just just incredible. So ever interested in in getting a sculpture and, and kind of, immortalizing one of those show animals, that that is a good direction to go. Ryan, this time of year, um, I get approached by multiple people either complaining or wanting to know how to better generate dollars for junior livestock auctions, particularly the, the livestock premium sales at county fairs. And it's a pretty big deal throughout the Midwest, throughout the country, literally. But right now, we're, we're in the heart of, of county fair season in the Midwest, and I thought it would be appropriate to Boy, have are topic. we ever. <laughs> yes. So today's topic is the junior livestock auction. I thought it'd be appropriate to, to simply bring somebody in and we have a guest today. And, and Ryan and I are so good with guests because we, we, yeah, we, we have, we have enough of a challenge scheduling our, getting our times together. And then you incorporate another person in there, but we were able to do this. And that was because Mr. John Dimmick was very cooperative with, with his time schedule. And what I would like is, is John's going to help guide us through how to build successful county premium sales and, and what they've done. And this introduction is going to get a little bit long, but it's, it's going to be okay. You'll understand why when, when I finish. John is, is 33 years of experience as a classroom ag teacher and FFA advisor, numerous major FFA awards achieved by his students, including the American degree, state degree, state proficiency awards, and four national champion livestock judging teams. He has 18 former students across five different states that have taught or currently teaching ag. In the early 90s, John wrote the bylaws for the formation of the Jackson County Junior Livestock Sale Incorporated, a 501c3 which annually annually conducts three youth market animal sales as part of the Jackson County Fair. This year, just to give you an idea, and that maybe this will get your attention a little bit, the gross sales for Jackson County Junior Livestock Premium Sale was $2.89 million. When we stop and, and think so about $3 that. $3 million. $3 million, just shy of it. It's, it's incredible. And, and I've had the privilege of working with John for many years uh, with the National FFA Livestock Contest Coaches Clinic. Ryan, you 
kindly came along last year and we did kind of a question and answer. Uh, my wife was one of John's students that was fortunate enough to be on one of those national champion FFA livestock teams. And Holly actually grew up showing in Jackson County. This would be in Southern Oregon. And she was under the impression, and I'm going to blame this on John, that you actually made money raising show animals, Ryan, showing livestock. What do you think of that? <laughs> do you make your family make any money showing livestock? No. We broke no. even one year. <laughs> That's good. L- l- That's let me take that back. Let me take that back. Wait, let me take that back. John Men's definition of breaking even was that when we added up what we took home from major shows, that equaled the cost of all the steers. That's not feed, fitters, all like whatever. But yeah, the, that wasn't breaking cost. even. No. That well, was Mr. his definition. He was very proud. He was very proud. <laughs> well, welcome, Mr. John Demick, to Beyond the Ring, our educational podcast. John, I, I appreciate you coming on with us, and uh, we're excited to to get some insight from you on on how Jackson County Livestock Premium Sale is has uh, done so well for so many years. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I uh, I first have to say I really enjoy your uh, your lead in. And the various things you talk about, many of which are dear to my heart, and I uh, I enjoyed that. That was really good. Well, good. Sometimes that that makes our guests nervous, but I, I assumed you'd be fine. Doesn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> good. Well, let let's start off, and and we already talked about how how this year's sales at two point eight nine million. Uh, some of the dollars that generate in that this county premium auction. Um. What are what are we looking at? And in, 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 and there's so many. I've got so many questions for you. What are our averages? Just to put that into perspective, because we don't know the number of animals and so forth. But some of the averages per species this year. Well, I'll just kind of give you a little rundown. Um, we sold approximately 200 lambs, and f- wait, 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 60 goats. And the lamb... You have 200 lambs at your fair? Okay, now, let me, since we're going to lay a little bit of ground rule here, we have two fairs. We have a spring Mm. fair, a spring fair in June, and then the regular county fair in July. And uh, it's based on the fact that years ago, our fairgrounds was not big enough to actually hold all the animals that all the kids would bring in. And so we split off the lambs and did them in June so that uh, we actually had room in the rest of the place for all the other animals. And actually, we built new fairgrounds and we all solved that problem. But one of the things that came of that was our buyer said, you know, we wouldn't mind if you kept the lambs early by themselves because that gives us a little bit of an opportunity to kind of keel up in time to yeah. come back for the for the July fair auctions. And so we've kept that, and it, it works fine. So anyway, back to the averages on those lambs, uh, $21.68 a pound. The goats were $28.58. So, and did the goat show in the same time in the spring with the lambs? Yeah, we, uh, we wrestled around. We, we added goats as a full species here about, uh, six years ago. And we struggled trying to figure out where to put them because we already had, had, uh, what we called three full auctions. And so we actually had a fourth auction for, uh, oh, about four years and we actually did them in the fall well that kind of doesn't dovetail real good with the resale program the prices on resale goats at that time of the year are just really low and so we talked to the sheep people with our hat in our hand and put them in with the with the lamb show and it's it's worked out fine they uh we sell both in the same sale. We alternate and uh, works good. So just to, just to summarize, so your your spring fair is, is I mean, it's, a, it's still a county fair. You're just breaking the lambs and goats out, showing them earlier. Yeah, separate show earlier. And then your later show would be the cattle and hogs. Cattle and hogs and the poultry. Okay, excellent. And, and where, 
in your you and, and as you stated, that's how far apart are those two shows? Okay, first weekend in June and uh, third week of July. So, and, and, and do you think that's that's helped with the buyers staying active, not not trying to hit them all with everything at one time? Yep, that's what that they tell us. One of the things you're going to hear from me today is that if you want to have a successful sale, you got to take care of your buyers. And how how were prices then on the hogs and the cattle? Okay, the swine, they were approximately two hundred in that show, uh, nineteen dollars and thirty six cents a pound. Steers were uh, ninety ninety nine steers, and they averaged eight dollars and eighty one cents a pound. Wow. Ryan, just, just so you know, my wife has been telling me for years, this is the best county fair in the country. And I obviously am always going to argue that. I, I can't of, believe they sell that many. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, that's, and, and John, not only, not only that you're, you're generating that kind of money, but you're generating that kind of money for that many animals where I'm, I'm sitting here in the, the Midwest. And if we put a hundred animals to the sale, that's a pretty big day. Of all species. And I was going to say, that's all species, though. Yes. And then begging, begging to get bids on it to get above the floor price. So how, how long have, have has, I mean, I've, I've obviously, I've had the opportunity to be out at Jackson County Fair, and it's, it's an impressive event. How long have prices been, I don't know about this good, but really solid at, at the fair? You know, that's kind of a forever thing. It's it just like I've been there 53 years. And we've always had really just spectacular buyer support from all facets of the community. They come down there and uh, just support those kids. We, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I, I guess when I, I, I think back to my own experience showing in a different county in the northern part of the state, I was, I was like you guys. I was kind of bowled over when I got here and. Uh, Anyway, uh, it's always all we've always been the leader, and I just think that uh, it just goes with the value that these people and businesses put on those kids, I guess. No, and, and my wife it has put it to me in a manner that she has explained to me those those buyers that come to support your your premium auction, they are they're very proud of the fact that they're supporting that. That's a almost a a culture that's. It's evolved. Oh, absolutely. And that's, that's amazing. How, how do you continue to foster that? I think one of the things that over the years, there's always been a few key players. Like we had a guy that uh, he's passed now, but for years came as a, as he owned a small chain of grocery stores and he would show up and he would support those kids and, then he would he would challenge his competitors to come down there and you know they probably couldn't match him but at least they'd show up and make some sort of uh, effort to at least be visible and we've had uh, things like that from the medical community and uh, just people dragging their friends down there and see me in action as I just buy something well then the friend decides well. If he can do it, I can do it, you know, and uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's just been one of those things where people want to want to be part of something. So what, what do you think you're doing different at that fair in terms of an auction committee or the individuals that are showing or all, all, of, all the above that has allowed this to foster and, and to continue, I guess, like you said, it's, it's, a, it's become a culture. So it's maybe a little bit different now than if, Somebody was trying to build a livestock premium sale to that to that level, but what are some of those key components? What what needs to be done to get to this point? All those families out there that are they're on different auction committees across the country at county fairs, and and I don't know this to be a fact, John, but I I'm I feel pretty safe, and maybe Ryan can help me. There cannot be another county fair that I'm aware of, and I know Napa Napa Valley they, they had some Bakersfield, high numbers. yeah. There, I mean, there's there's some pretty high ones. I don't know if there's any that, 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 I don't know if they passed that, but Bakersfield 
is in the millions of dollars. So, so, so John Bakersfield has a uh, large component of uh, breeding animals that they sell. We don't. Right. All of ours are market. So what, what, what is, what, how would you guide some of these, these people on these committees? What, what direction do they need to take or what, what do they need to do that you guys are doing to help foster this? Well, I think the first step is you have to really get a focused and passionate committee that uh, takes on the project and explain that, yeah, those people need to be there for the long haul. There's, uh, we have seven people on our committee and uh, basically the uh, only way you get off is to die. And, and that's, that's, and I assume they're proud to be on this committee. I very much, but I, I, I just think that, you know, when you got people that are doing good things and doing them for the right reasons, like our committee is, you don't just flippantly change people. And I, I've been around different counties. I judge a little myself and get to some different fairs and you'll find people like a whole new committee because they all just like rotated off and uh, brought new people in. Well, so we're, we're going to all just like reinvent the wheel, you know, and uh, our, our edict as I guess, well, we've invented the wheel. We're not going to reinvent it. We're just going to polish it and make it better. And that's, that's, that's what, uh, that's kind of our approach. And, uh, you know, if we make, if we make change, it's with uh, real good reasons behind it. And, uh, you know, we, we do things that uh, we're probably pretty conservative, but I think our results show that uh, we're successful. I think the one thing that I just want to, like, bring up that you hit on so far is is you say that it's kind of a culture there in your county. And then you said that once you're on that committee, the only way you get off is you die. And so... We've, we've talked about the Houston Stock Show uh, committees, and it, it is just like you are describing right there. It is a culture, and like people literally wait for someone to either die or to retire to be on those committees for years. So I understand a great deal about what you're saying there, and so I would uh, I would say Houston and Jackson County kind of run things the same way, you know, it, it is interesting to me how, how that, that is, is evolved into such, but John, what about, um, what are the junior? And, and I guess I, I, I have some insight on this, just, just visiting with my wife about it. And, and I'm sure this is done in other, other counties, but it appears to me, there's a genuine effort made by the committee to give those juniors a little push to go out and recruit buyers and make sure that they're thanked appropriately. Give us a little bit on, on that, if you would. We, uh, we strongly encourage that uh, kids go out and personally contact buyers uh, head of the sales. Uh, we encourage delivering of handwritten buyers letters. We strongly discourage uh, computer-generated uh, you know, pieces of technology. We We'd like those kids to be able to, uh, you know, show that they can write and do things in complete sentences and stick out their hand and, and meet people. And, uh, I can tell you with certainty that you talk to a lot of those buyers and they absolutely love the season before the sales when all those kids are, uh, coming by offices and businesses and whatever to, uh, and, and this is not shooting them a text message or call them. They're showing up in person. <laughs> I can guarantee you a text message would just be ignored. <laughs> Forget it. No, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm talking to an in-person visit. That's good. And, and would you say most of those kids get out there and get that done? I would say probably 80% get that yep, done. Yep. And, and that shows that, I mean, those, those are the ones that are, I'm, I'm not saying the other 20% don't, don't do well in the sale, but those that get out there and, and do that, they're, they're rewarded for it. Absolutely. I, uh, I work all the sales in the ring and, uh, you know, I, my people in my section, I, I watch what they're doing and most of them have sale orders and 
most of them have gone through those sale orders ahead of time and made notations as to whether a certain child has come by and visited them and given them some information. And I can tell you there's some of them that uh, they won't talk to a kid the night of the sale. They, they want to have the discussion earlier and they will only bid on animals that are, uh, they've had contact with them. When that, that young person enters a business and asks for the owner or the manager, whoever's, whoever's in charge of, of buying and, and looks them in the eye and shakes their hand and, and asks personally for their support, that that's going to go a long ways. It just is. And if, if, if that owner resonates somehow or, or connects with that, that child or that youth, that's, 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 that's bringing almost an emotional tie into it that they want to help this kid. And then that, that is, that is amazing. I, I remember how they had told me a story about one of the, the kids this year, maybe going into one of the businesses and somehow the topic came up about maybe politics a little bit and, and where this, this child wasn't afraid to, to throw out there that he was pretty darn conservative and, and where he stood on things. And I think it went over very well. Now it could have went the other way. I understand, but it's, it's interesting. Yes. It's, it's interesting how that and and I, I think there's other other young people throughout the country that that do some of that, but I, I don't think at this level. I, I just I just don't. And I, I can't encourage those committees out there. I mean, even if it hasn't been done before, you've you've got to get it started somewhere. And and that's that is a really critical place. I've been to fairs where they actually discourage it. And it just saddens me when I hear that that you know, no, no, we don't want them bothering those buyers. We don't want them, you know, taking their time away to, to, uh, you know, meet with them. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that, you know, we're not selling livestock. We're selling kids. And uh, what better way to, to make that connection than to do that? I just hate it when I hear stories of, oh, yeah, that kid, he went in and talked to somebody and, so now we're going to sanction them or something. I just hate that. Well, I think it makes a great deal of sense because like what you're saying, I, I tell people this all the time and nobody believes me, but I can just from my own personal experience, it just happened two weeks ago. So I can't tell you how many letters that I get in the mail and they're, they're just like you said, they're computer generated and they're not handwritten and all this stuff. And there may be a picture or whatever, please support my, my steer Bessie is going to sell at such and such date and whatever, and all this other stuff. And, and I mean, it is what it is, but the, the handwritten thing, anytime I get a handwritten thank you card or anything like that, like there's just an immediate, this means more. And it just is. But the, the big thing that I wanted to touch on that you talked about, these kids going into these businesses and meeting these people and having that one-on-one deal. A hundred adults can come up and talk to me or see me at a show and say, hey, you know, the Texas Main on Jew Association is doing a raffle for a gator or whatever, all this other stuff. It's $20 ticket. Will you whatever? If it's an adult, I'm not going to do it. I mean, I'll, I'll just say, hey, I don't have any cash on me. Come find me later, whatever. Two weeks ago at a county fair, I was walking in to judge show. This young man walks up, and I don't I don't even know what it was. Uh, but he was taking uh, donations for something. And uh, he asked if I wanted to donate, and he introduced himself, whole nine yards. And I said, look, buddy, I'm walking in here to judge this show. I said, my wallet is in my car. But if you will wait till I get done judging this show... And come back and go with me to the car. I'll give I'll get you some money. And sure enough, I don't even think about it again because till and sure enough, since I did, we walked to the car and I gave him twenty bucks. And uh, you're not going, or some people will, but the large majority are not going to tell a kid no. And uh, I, I think that is such a smart, smart idea uh, that you, that y'all have created there, sending them out into the businesses and all, and one-on-one FaceTime with them, please come out, support our auction. And, and it does, you know, like you were saying, 80% of them do it. Well, 20% don't. But if that, if one kid 
goes to a dozen businesses or 10 businesses or five businesses. Only one person can buy that animal. But those people are still going to be there and they're going to buy somebody's animal. And and that's that's what gets it right there. And so such a smart, smart idea. I, uh, kudos to y'all on that because just brilliant. Because I'm telling you, I know from personal experience, watching my parents, watching myself, all that, if the kid comes in and is sincere, well-spoken, all of those things, it is very hard for someone to turn them down cold. Well, just think about the experience, the value of that experience to the kid, whether the guy buys his animal or not. He's going in there and meeting him and looking him in the eye and, you know, the the uh, character building of that and right. the skill building of, of just interacting with, with your adults. That's That's a huge part of that. No, I, I love it, and John. I, I did some rough math. Are, are, and I, I could be wrong. In in the the full year of selling all species, um, minus, and I didn't even put the poultry in there. Are you are you at five hundred animals or better? That's that's a lot. We uh, we actually COVID hurt us, and we had uh, we had a couple of years where our numbers were were impacted significantly. We were down i think to like uh 70 steers and uh you know 150 lambs and about the same with pigs and so we've had to rebuild from that but uh even then those prices stayed up we uh we quickly uh maneuvered over to a, a online uh buying system and uh you know the prices did not drop it's just that trying to get people at the sale was a little bit problematic. But as soon as as soon as COVID started to abate, the numbers just soared right back up. Right, that's awesome. And are the the youth allowed to? I assume they only allowed to sell one animal. No, we allow them. We allow them to sell two large animals and one small animal. And a small animal is poultry and rabbits and. Mm-hmm. So they can sell. They can sell a calf and a lamb, or a pig and a. They and can. A the combination is they can sell a lamb or a goat, and then a calf or a pig. Exactly. So one in each sale. Well, yep. Yep. Uh, that was initially the deal, but then when we merged the goats with the lambs, right. we said, "Okay, well, we'll let you if you want to do a lamb and a goat, you can do that." but then you're done. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it, it's, that's, that's a significant, that's a significant return for those kids to, to put into a college fund or into their project next year. That's, that's incredible. That's how my son paid his college. Yeah. Dale, I, I can't believe you didn't move. <laughs> well, there's, there's still that chance, I guess. Um, and, and this is, this is the, you do not life. know how tight this man is. That's all he cares about <laughs> is making money. I'm so shocked you haven't shipped Lord help. That I'm surprised you true. have not shipped Katie and your wife out there in the, like a box along the highway. Or now, something. it is my wife that wants to move to Texas for the majors, not not I. No, yeah, you will not. not. And I I do not want you to move to Texas for the Good. majors either, as long as Katie still has eligibility. After, you can do whatever you want, but not, 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 <laughs> not, not, not before she's done. So, so John, the other, the other thing that I, I, and I, I'm not sure that I'm correct on this. I assume that all these animals that are going through the premium auction are terminal. There's no buybacks. They're done. They're harvested. This is, this is a terminal sale and, uh, we keep close track. Everything that goes on the, on the resale truck that, uh, you know, the buyers did not want and we bought back and are sending off to slaughter at market price we follow them and make sure they all get to where they're going and uh and i think that help that helps when when they aren't sneaking out the back door and all those things it just gives it a gives those i I guess it it puts a situation there that there's nothing questionable going on if that makes sense we have we have uh, arrangements with all of our processors that uh anybody calls up and wants to go through your pen Tell them to forget it, and uh, 
every year somebody tries, but they're not successful. And I, and I assume you as an auction or your committee, um, obviously you're, you're, you're treating the buyers before the sale to, to a dinner or you're doing everything as best you can. We do three different barbecues uh, for each sale, one before each sale. And uh, we, um, if they're a successful buyer, they get a really nice custom made buyer's hat and uh, buyer's card with a picture on it. And and then Ryan, this will sound crazy to you, but and again, I'm I'm going off, and I should have just had my wife on here to 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 jump on the this this podcast tonight. But the hats, the, when you you say sending those out, those those buyers take pride in wearing those hats. It's it's kind of a big deal. It's a huge deal. It's interesting to me that it just all goes back to that culture, Ryan, that that you and I had talked about the volunteers to to park cars at Houston or to do anything. It, it's it's a culture that. Fortunately for John and Jackson County, they they already have that built into play where somebody that's trying to build, it's going to take longer, but you have to start somewhere. And I'm telling you, if you, if you want to look at Jackson County, Oregon as, as an example, and why why reinvent the wheel, as John says, here's here's what they're doing. Try to try to do the same. If something works that well, why not follow that lead? I, I it, it just makes sense to me. And there's going to be communities that that don't have that many businesses. There, there's there's going to be a lot of places, no matter what you do, aren't going to get to this level, but let's go as far as we can. Let, let's get what we can and, and make it positive. Yep. We, uh, we do one other thing that I think uh, bears fruit, not only with buyers, but also with the kids. We, uh, we borrow a large amount of money at the uh, start of the sale season, large notes so that we can actually pay those kids. So like if sale is on a Saturday, we try to have checks in their hands on Monday. Wow. Do what? Uh, yeah. How did I, blah, 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 blah. You're telling me that I sell my steer on Saturday and you're going to give me a check on Monday? I'm moving to Oregon and I'm buying a kid. Okay, what town is this? <laughs> oh, I have never heard of that in my life. So, John, you're basically taking out a loan that you pay back fairly quick, I assume. Is uh, you know, I can't think of every sale around here. Oh yeah, we got to wait until we gather all the money up, and then we're going to pay the kids. You know, well, crap. I, I've heard of kids not getting paid till December. Well, I know the feed store didn't doesn't want to wait till December. You know, holy, this is blowing my mind. We uh, we borrow, oh, I don't know. We'll probably borrow a million and million and a half, give or take. And uh, then as the uh, payments come in, then we pay that note off. But uh, the bottom line is is that every kid is going to get a check and he's going to get it in a timely manner. And some, some of those kids may have fee bills to pay. They may have borrowed money to, to buy that project, to, to fund that project. Wow. That, that is, that is amazing. Whew. The, only, the only, the only stipulation is they can't get their check until they, they write out a handwritten thank you card and give it to us in a stamped envelope so that we can, Mail it off to the buyer, but that's that's not asking for too much. Not if I have my steer sell Saturday, you gonna give me a check the next week. So, so, I Ryan, mean, you can, card you won't. You can back me up on this one. I I can think of many. That years. does not happen anywhere. No. Anywhere. Let anywhere. me let me let me give you an example. Of the Illinois State Fair. We we enjoy picking. Oh please! Do, why do you always have to bring that place up? <laughs> this is not a good thing. <laughs> And it's not the superintendents. It's not any of that level. It is the state fair management and, and how things are run. Ryan, there's judges that didn't get paid for six months. When we sell on the, the champion sale. I might know in, one. In August. I mean, we we maybe. It's spring before. I mean, it's it's six, seven, eight, nine. It's it's a very long time before we ever see a check. Yeah, that, that is, again, there's so many amazing things that is going on with this. Cell committee. What does, that, what does that teach kids when you, you know, you make them wait six months to, to get paid for something that they've got a lot of money tied up in? 
it's 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 there there's no logic to it whatsoever but i i'm afraid that's more the norm than not oh i think you're right oh it, yeah i promise you it is i mean and i don't think it i don't think most of them are 6 months but i would say from the i mean i have had lots of families in lots of county fairs across texas and you know and and know people that show and i would say well, well over 75% of the county fairs across Texas. And I, I'm not going to say six months, but a month or two is, I would say two months is pretty quick. Like that, if you, if you got your check in a month or two, your fares on it, not three days. Jeez. <laughs> no, exactly. Okay. Right. So me and Katie are moving to Jackson County, Oregon and y'all, <laughs> She likes me oh, more than Dale anyway. Oh gosh! So I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the dollars, John, and 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 I I think the most important is that average dollar amount that you guys are talking about. Are the champions? Where, where are some of the champions? Just for cur- my curiosity, where do the champions' prices fall? Are you a little above it, way above it, or does that fluctuate on you? Well, you know they they flex a little, but uh our champion lamb was fifty two dollars champion goat was ninety champion pig was eighty two champion steer was thirty champion pen of chickens was a hundred and ten for a uh nineteen pound pen but uh Ryan you doing the math on this that's for about forty two thousand dollars for the champion steer yeah Holy cow! At a, at a at a I'm county good at fair math when I need to be at a local county fair in Southern Oregon, a very beautiful place, by the way. Maybe maybe politically not any different than Illinois as a state, but that area is probably pretty conservative. We hope. Yeah. Yeah. What was that? The Southern Oregon and Northern California. We're going to go into. Jefferson sta- stated, and then never, it just doesn't ever seem to happen, but I, I'm not opposed to that. No, it's just, it's a, it's been around since uh, world war two. Hmm. Well, this, this is good, John, any, any other things that, that we can kind of guide our listeners and into things that they can bring up at their committee and, and anything that we're missing that you want to want to throw in there? Well, you know, something that, um, I think is important that we do. We, we take a commission charge out of the uh, kids' checks. By the time you spend $50,000 on barbecues and all the various things that are just part of doing business, um, you know, you got, you got to have a source of funds to pay for that. But uh, one of the things we do, which I think is a cool thing, we've actually made the fair – a partner because they uh, they have expenses too, and it's like when we uh, we run our barbecues, it basically just shuts down Food Row. Nobody buys anything out there because they're all over our place eating, you know, and uh, all the other things that uh, we actually cost the fair. So we give them we give them a percent of of our uh, commission. So that makes them, uh, when we go down and ask them for, say, 200 reserve parking passes for some of our buyers and passes to get them in and all that sort of stuff, they're pretty quick to take care of us because they know it will reflect to them and increase receipts to them. So making them a partner, I think, is is a smart deal. No, that, that makes perfect sense. It doesn't cost you that much to do that. Excellent. 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 Ryan, do you have any other questions? Uh, I just am looking on my computer for houses in this county. Me and Katie are moving. I think the housing market's kind of steep there right now. I think it's been on an incline. You've got lots of money. It's fine. <laughs> no, no, I do not. I de- de- definitely do not. Well, John, we're gonna we're gonna move into question and answer, and you're welcome. To, I, I don't know if any of these are relevant to what we're talking about today, but you're welcome to stay with us, and uh, we 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 sure do appreciate you jumping in here. 
Ryan, are you ready for question and answer? Do you have a sponsor you'd like yes, to talk about? Yes, we do. We have Basic Animal Health, which is also, uh, and I want to thank them and Leonard Truck and Trailers for all they do for the BTRJLA. But Basic Animal Health is proud to sponsor the question and answer portion of the Beyond the Ring podcast. And when you go to www.basicanimalhealth.com and you purchase any of their products at the checkout, if you will put in the code BTRJLA, we will get a portion of the proceeds from those products from Basic Animal Health that go to help pay for the awards for these great kids. So go to Basic Animal Health's website, purchase Gut Health, Show Focus, or Trailer Ride. They're getting new products every single day. And thank you, Basic Animal Health, for your contributions as well as the Leonard family and Leonard Truck and Trailer. Thank you very much. The first question comes to us from Justin. And uh, John, you might be able to, to jump in on this one. We'll, we'll see how Ryan does first, but we can we can jump in as well. This is a long one, Ryan. Oh, Jesus. I have a question about judging teams. I go to Wilmington College. It's a small agriculture college in Wilmington, Ohio. There's been talk of starting a livestock judging team since I started my freshman year. Now, starting my senior year, we still do not have a team or anything close to it. I've made a personal goal of trying to start one my final year. Do you have any pointers that would help? The pushback that the administration has is that they would have to hire a full-time coach. And that is, is this necessary? And it's not in the budget. Do you have a full-time coach in order to be successful or do you have to have a full-time coach to be successful? This is the college level and any help would be greatly appreciated. Yes, you have to have a full-time coach to be successful. Now, I don't think that you have to have a full-time coach to have a team other than the fact that I would think that almost any university would make there be an employee that is in charge of the children, even though they're college students, whatever, when they go on these various trips and all this stuff. But yes, to be successful, you do have to have a full-time coach. Uh, that the, be, and the, the easy answer to that is, is all the other ones do. I, I think you can, if you have a part-time coach that will, you know, set some stuff up, take you to contest, stuff like that. I still think that you'll get a lot of, of the great things that you get from the judging team experience, regardless of whether you were successful at the contest or not, because it's just like everything else. Not everybody wins, but everybody takes a lot from that experience and you learn things. I'm to to this day. uh, Again, I, I don't think that livestock judging does much in terms of creating judges for the show ring, but I learned more on my one year in the judging team than I did in any other event that I I participated in. And just because I had never done anything as a team, nothing. And so uh, to be successful, yeah, you're going to have a full-time coach, but if they would at least get a part-time coach, I think that it would be a beneficial thing for y'all and you would still get a great deal of experience and reward out of it. Excellent. And John, you've, you've had plenty of experience coaching. Were you, are you in the same page as Ryan on this one? You know, I, I am. I think that there's a huge benefit to having somebody on staff all the time because that's not just an after hours, you know, show up mm-hmm. at practice kind of a job. There's a lot of contact and a lot of relationships that are important that, that take place throughout the day and the week and the year. And I absolutely would support Ryan, but I, I, I I have one little thing in the back of my mind and that has probably to do with, uh, university or college hiring rules and practices and all that sort of stuff that probably would throw a wrench into some of this stuff. Yes, absolutely. And I, and I think it's in, 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 for our, our young man that submitted the question, Justin, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough situation. And maybe there's, there's people out there willing to volunteer or come in part time, but as, as John mentioned, sometimes the the administration there at the college or some of their policies that's that's easier said than done, if, if that makes sense. Yep. Okay. Next question comes from Casey. Hey guys, I would like both of you to describe the ideal finish on market goats and lambs and how you measure that when evaluating. You're gonna love this one, Ryan. <laughs> 
you, go ahead and tell them you handle them, but you really aren't doing anything. You just just for the just to go through the motions. It has nothing to do. But no, I don't. I handle them, but it's not to go through the motions. But it has nothing to do with the finish per se. I mean, like, so when you're handling them, you're not. It's not going through your mind. This one's fat or lean. Well, or yes, confirming. but yes. I mean, obviously, there are going to be instances where one's too raw and one's too fat. But the large majority are not that way where it's the large majority of sheep or goats that I handle. They are not going to be greatly discounted because they are overly fat or overly thin. Does that make sense to you? Discounted Dale? in the show ring. Right now, again, they throw the commercial industry out of it because they, whatever, but uh, I mean, the only way you do it is by handling them. So I, I, I agree with you that they're the 80% of them that you have are going to fit what we consider right. that acceptable that's, window. That's, that's what I was meaning to say that, that 80% are fine. But my, my problem with it, and when we're starting to get there in the goats as well, that, that because so many lambs are brought to you with so much more condition now than, than maybe five years ago or 10 years ago. And, and again, I'm not saying anything's wrong with it because they're all in a similar Similar level, I guess, in terms of where that that finish is. I I think it's 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 maybe more than we need. But what does that extra finish do? It smooths everything out. It makes them just a little more massive. Everything. I mean, there's a lot of bonuses that come with that. My request is when you when you continue to bring these these sheep into the ring, Ryan, when they are a little fat, I, I would really appreciate if they just brace them a little bit, mm-hmm. just a little. I don't, we, we we talked about that last week on the show. <laughs> so back so that. with with the goats, Ryan are, and and I and I I'd be happy. To, I, I think there's a lot of goats that are too lean. I think there's some goats that are too fat. Uh, there's probably more variation in the goats than the lambs. Can we agree on that? Yes. Um, and, and maybe because there's but goats see, shown at, there's think, more goats shown at real lightweights that are just going to be skinny. I, I think it's, but I think there is more variation in goats. But I think. Very, I, I think there's a lot more that are too raw than too fat in goats for me. Yes, but I think that the trend is quickly changing because we're we're figuring out while wow, we get a goat fat, they look pretty good. Right. So I, I think you're going to see more and more of that. But it's just hard to get a 60, 70 pound goat fat. So we 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 don't we just don't see. I, I guess the window of weights and goats that you see at the shows is usually wider than the window you see for lambs, um, for the most part, in in terms of where their maturity is. So I think we're gonna. We're going to run into those, those thin ones all the time. And I know Ryan does not, he's going to have a fit if I even, even bring this up, but I'm going to, cause I, I'm not <sighs> sure where, where Casey is on this. If I were to guess where the rib fat is on these show lambs today, on these popular show lambs, winning state or national level shows, I'm going to say it's, it's probably fatter than we need to be. Where would I like to be Casey? I'd like to be in that two to three tenths range. 2,500 is plenty. And, and if you'd asked me many years ago, I'd have said less than that. Um, but I, I don't think there's many of them probably under three tenths anymore of, of rib fat and goats. I, I don't, I don't even want to, it, it, there's so much variation. I don't even want to try. So that, that is, that is our commercial commercial side of it. John, do you, do you see any, any differences on your, on what's coming through Jackson County or when you're out and about? My answer is more of a question, and it relates to the commercial side. When we, unfortunately, when we uh, sell all of our goats, the bigger percentage of them goes on the resale truck and goes up the road to a commercial packer that buys them all. So my question is, is what what do you think is the ideal weight for the uh, commercial market? I can, I can regurgitate what I've, what I've garnered from some of the, the buyers in Texas that I've visited with, and it's been a couple of years ago. Traditionally speaking, and it may be changing because there's such a demand for, for goat meat and there's not enough supply, but traditionally speaking, that this gentleman would go through, I mean, several thousand purchased goats that he'd ship off to, to packing plants each month. He was wanting to be in that 50 to 60 pound range. Lighter, the better is, is where the demand was right then. But because there's such a demand, I'm not so sure that you still can't take those goats fairly heavy and get a pretty decent price. But I think tradition, whether it was a size to put on a barbecue, I, I don't know. 
I don't know why tradition was that light, but traditionally speaking, there's a culture that wants lighter weight goats. Now that that is maybe changing, but at that time it was definitely less is better. Yeah, because he, he he told us that he would like them at seventy five. So it's a little a little heavier. Not not one hundred and ten. No, but and yeah. So so it's it's interesting. I mean, there there's a huge demand, so that the Packers are pretty much going to have to take what what they get and are happy to get it. But it it, it is interesting how how that that works. And if we were to go out there and pick a sixty pound goat or even a seventy five pound goat to win a national show, Ryan, that's you you you'd, you'd be one to pick whatever weight before most, but that that would be considered a little bit light. Would you agree? Yes, but I would still do it if I thought it was the best. Yes, you would, and I appreciate that about you a great deal. The final question comes from Amanda for showmanship specifically. If there's not a number handed out, in other words, a, a card with a number of for that exhibitor mm-hmm. at a jackpot show. And they're, the kids usually wear a harness. I'm assuming we're talking probably more cattle, even though. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a keep going on and I'll finish. <laughs> What's the rest okay. of the question? Okay. Number harness question. I'm going to restate number harness question, exclamation point. For showmanship, more specifically, if a number is not handed out at a small jackpot, should the kids still wear a number harness? Also, side note, where are some good places to buy a custom number harness? I know. I, I think I know nothing show. about custom lot. number harnesses because I do not like custom number harnesses. I think so. I I am not your go to person for that, uh, and we don't even allow it, it in Texas at major shows. Like if you have your brand or your name or whatever on a custom number, you got to put duct tape over it. So anyway, don't know anything yeah, about that's that. Tacky, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> don't know anything about that. So can't answer that. I, I can tell you that. When I am judging showmanship and I do not look to see if they have a number on or a number harness on or anything like that, I think that you would probably, whether they in cattle and only in cattle, whether they give you a number or not, I think you would probably be better served by wearing a number harness because if you don't, there's probably going to be some judge that will be like, well, they didn't have the proper equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So I would just say as a rule of thumb, whether they give you a number at that show or not, wear one. Uh, because I think you you can't get hurt that way. By not, by not wearing one, you could. You, you're not going to get hurt by wearing one, even if they didn't give you a number. The other thing that I want to put out there, and I have put this out there before, but I'm going to put it out. If you are showing a pig... A goat or a sheep, for the love of God, do not wear a number harness. Why is it okay in cattle and not the others? I, it just is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great reasoning. It so I, just I wish looks dumb. I wish you were dumb. I wish you were wrong about having to wear a harness, even if there isn't a number, because I could care less if that showman. I for me, it does not matter. But I am telling you, I am trying to answer this lady's question the best that I can. <laughs> you know, there is going to be somebody. You're right. That, well, that somebody uh, that somebody should not be judging showmanship. Yeah, well, they're going to, and they're going to be saying, "Well, this kid did not have a number harness on, so they're fourth. And so again, just wear one. But if you are showing a sheep, a goat, or a pig, do not, do not do it. Do not. It, those, you look those little clips that go in your back pocket. You clips. Get, get a in. safety pin. Put it on your back. I do not care. But do not wear. Hun- but the, I am. Ten- but you shouldn't. You should not discredit a kid for doing that. There's no it logical reason dumb. not to. Well, it it should dumb. look just as dumb on it a looks dumb. kid as it does. It them. doesn't. It doesn't. It does not. It does. Not. Oh my! Your fashion sense, you. John. I have. I have something. I. I I think I brought this up on the podcast maybe before and and you can answer this for me. And, and I, I, Ryan talking about showmanship and talking about, we just did that to, last week. Yeah, We're not talking no, about it for another year. No. This one about wearing a harness or what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. John, I, I judged the Oregon state fair pig show a very long time ago. And they let was, you judge a state fair pig show. <laughs> it was a hundred, it was a hundred degrees. Probably it was hot, very hot. And I, I made a comment on the microphone that all the FFA kids had their official dress on and their FFA jackets. And without putting a lot of thought into it, I told them, I don't care if you come in with your FFA jacket. And, and it wasn't popular with your fellow ag teachers. 
That's because they have a rule there that uh, kids have to wear official dress Just unless the division superintendent excuses them and lets them take their jackets off. Got it. So they're they're following the rule. So they're following that rule. Makes sense. I, I caught quite a bit of grief over that from from a few ag teachers, I believe. But uh, no, that it's it's interesting how how it's different everywhere, and and we do see that official dress more on the West Coast than than we do in this part of the country, or even even in Texas. But well, this has been good, Ryan. Thank you, John. I appreciate you taking the time to come on and, and lend some insight into into the success that that Jackson County Fair has had, and and thank you. I love talking about something that I'm pretty passionate about. Excellent. Until next week, be safe. You come, y'all come back now. You hear? Ha, <laughs> ha,